let's go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Mary Kay Fink, and I am the advanced practice nurse at the MS Center. And often this topic um, is something that I really enjoy presenting because it's something that I think that is under, as we'll see in some slides, under talked about, and something that I think that um, I have the ability to, to spend time with folks. And so based on our structure of our center is something that we get to uh, manage within our center instead of having to refer out. So we're gonna talk about, and I had to get a little tickle in there to keep you here, uh, depression, GAD, who knows what that is, and spilled milk. So let's go ahead and get started. So this is the World Health Organization definition of what depression is. It's a common mental disorder characterized by sadness, loss of interest, uh, not feeling pleasure in things, having guilt, feelings of guilt or low self-esteem or self-worth that's often manifested itself by disruption in sleep, appetite, fatigue, and an inability to concentrate. Well, you think about that list, you think, well, how do we know if it's depression or MS? And that's actually part of what we need to do is sort that out and tease that out. Now, you get the sense of what this is. Um, many of you may feel some of these at some time in um, their life with, in, with MS. So 50% of people with MS may have major depressive disorder. So MDD is the abbreviation. And that doesn't happen all the time. But again, if you think about a lifespan of MS, that could be 40 years. 50% of people with MS will experience this major depressive disorder. Again, that's three times higher than the general population. And so again, something that although we don't really talk about a whole lot, we should, because it's higher than the uh, normal population. Unfortunately, we don't exactly know why that incidence is higher. In fact, we know that when we look about at the incidence of depression in the MS population, it's not only three times higher than the general population, it's also higher than the population with other chronic diseases. So it's not necessarily just the disease itself or the situational depression that can happen with the disease. There's probably some kind of chemical basis to this. And so this is really the toughest cell. And thank you for staying in this room because really depression is an illness. And as a society, we still don't recognize it as an illness. It's not a weakness. Really, it's a flaw in chemistry, not character. Yet, people that have depression feel it's their fault. They feel something is wrong with them. It's a character flaw. And they can't just stop it. it there's really no just pull yourself up by the bootstraps and go on with life. Depression is something that needs to be recognized and treated. So you would never say to a cancer patient, just get over it. But we tend to say that as a society to people that have depression. Just get over it. Take a, get, get on with life. It'll go away. Things will look better tomorrow. So again, it deserves our attention. It deserves a talk when we're talking about comorbidity illnesses related to or linked to MS. As I said, it is three times higher in the MS population, but it's not necessarily linked to disability, certainly not physical disability. And unfortunately, depression, if untreated, can be cited as the cause of suicide in about 15% of MS folks. Remember, people don't die from MS, but people may die from self-injury. And so it is important, again, that we pay attention and listen for the clues. Again, depression has many, many different faces. We know that it's common, but we may not recognize it. We may not see it. We may have to look beyond the surface. I don't know how many people will come in my office and they can fake it for a good hour. They can say everything's great, everything's fine, but until you look deep and you look under the surface and ask the right questions, 
do you really realize that there is some underlying mood disorder? Unfortunately, those with depression, 30% or probably greater, don't seek help. And that's a tragedy. That's where those suicidal numbers come in, is when we don't pay attention and we don't get help. Um, but it's difficult. It takes time. Because remember I said poor appetite, fatigue, problems concentrating, weight gain can all be signs of depression. They also could be symptoms of MS. And so there's this interplay with them that we have to tease out. What's depression? What's MS? And sometimes we can't because they're so intertwined. So we also need to pay attention to medical conditions. Things like anemia, vitamin deficiencies, and thyroid disease must be ruled out because they can also cause some of those symptoms that may give us those tendencies to think that it's, it could be depression. So we have to pay attention to the medical diseases and make sure that everything's okay there. So when you come to our center, we ask you, who's, when's the last time you had your thyroid checked if you're, if you're fatigued or you've gained weight or you've lost a ton of weight? Because we have to make sure, what's your vitamin B? What's your vitamin D? What's your supplements that you are taking? So again, because of this overlay, it takes time. We have to figure out if fatigue is related to MS because that's certainly a, a standalone symptom, but it also could be a direct result of the depression. So again, figuring these things out, Dr. Green alluded to sleep disorders that are very common in MS, but as you can see, we can get ourselves into this cycle where we have depression that causes anxiety, maybe cause some physical pain related to that, that causes insomnia, that causes cognitive changes, and it goes on and on and on. And we might be able to intervene in any of these different points, but if we do and we have a good impact of in, at any of these different points, we might be able to break that cycle. And so, again, it's important that we, we pay attention to what the, what the folks in front of us are saying, what the people with MS are saying to us. We have to listen closely. Not only that, we have to listen to their families. And sometimes they don't agree. Um, there's a weak association with some of the disease-modifying therapies in MS. Not strong, but as, as Dr. Green alluded to earlier, there's some that may also increase depression and may have in their label su suicide as one of their, their um, counter, not counter, side effects. We certainly know that if you don't sleep well, you don't think well. But if you don't sleep well, you don't think well, then you get yourself all anxious, and then you go and you get yourself on the hamster wheel where you're going back and back forth. So again, we have to figure out what's major depressive disorders, what's MS, and if we interrupt one, can we affect positively the quality of life so that people with MS have um, a fulfilled, hopeful existence. So here are some of the characteristics. And some of this you can see if you just watch TV and watch the right commercials, right? So feeling sad. Feeling sad sometimes isn't just feeling sad and boo-hooing at the commercials. It's just feeling like, I don't have enough emotions. I don't get happy. I don't get sad. I'm just kind of bleh. So that could be it. Irritability, being short-tempered, being short-fused, being kind of just, oh my god, I got this itch. It won't go away. Or, oh my god, can you believe that guy's driving 45 miles an hour when the speed limit is 40 or, or 50? What's up with that? That can be it. It could be crying. Rarely is it crying all day, but it could be. Loss of energy. That's a big one. When you just don't feel like you got the oomph, and especially if you don't got the oomph to do something that you really, really like. When you, when you decrease pleasure, or get pl don't get pleasure from activities that typically give you pleasure, that's a big signal that something's going on and that we need to pay attention to that. 
Change in appetite. It could be up or it could be down. Weight, the same thing. It could be up or it could be down. Same thing with sleep, and that's why it says unusual sleep behaviors. People with depression could go to bed at 7.30 at night and wake up at 10 o'clock in the next morning and still feel like they're tired. Likewise, they could go to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning and wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning as a direct sign of their depression. So as weight can be either way, appetite can be either way, sleep can be either way. The, diff, the, the, the barometer is to measure against what's normal. What was your normal patterns? And normal might have to go back a few months. What was your normal six months ago versus now? Decreased sex drive also, again, can be a direct problem with MS as the nerves don't innervate the sexual impulses and potentially libido but it's also a very common symptom with people that have depression. And then suicidal thoughts. And suicidal thoughts don't mean I'm gonna get a gun and I'm gonna put a gun to my head. It could mean that, but it also could be, I don't know if I have a purpose on this earth. I don't know why I wanna get up tomorrow. I don't know if I should get up tomorrow. It could just be, why am I here on this earth? What, is, what am I getting out of life? Or I'm a burden to my family, which is another one that comes across as this suicidal tendencies. My family would be better off without me. That can all be these direct signs of depression. So what are we going to do about it? Well, of course, everybody wants a pill, right? It's the easy fix. Give me a pill, Mary Kay, give me a pill. I, I'll take a pill. Nobody needs to know about it. It's easy to swallow a pill once a day or twice a day. That works. And we have some very good medications for depression. But I'll tell you, using all three of these strategies is how to best manage depression in the long term. And that is antidepressive medications as needed, psychotherapy, which is really talk therapy, and I'm gonna talk about each of these a little bit more in depth, and taking a wellness approach. And we talk a lot about wellness, but we're gonna put that, and that's kind of a, a lumping category about what you can do to make your, uh, to modify things so that your depression is at its best. So here's a list, it's not an inclusive list, it's just a list of some of the medications that we commonly use for depression. And there's now three and four generation of these medications. So ultimately, it, um, it starts with a conversation with a healthcare provider that say, let's talk about your symptoms, let's see if we can manage those with one of these medications or a different medication. Um, bottom line is none of these medicines work right away. The second is many of them need to be titrated, meaning you start at a lower dose and so you might need to dose up. And they take a long time to evaluate their effectiveness. So two to four to six weeks before we may see some positive effects of these medications, and every single one of them has an adverse effect column, which may include things like the things we're trying to get rid of. The insomnia, the decreased libido, the somnolence, the feeling foggy, but our goal is to see if we can find one that gives us benefit without the side effects or manage those side effects if that is the case. All right, talk therapy. Nobody wants to do this. Come on, really? Mary Kate, I'll take that pill, but you want me to talk to somebody? Well, I'll tell you, that's very beneficial. You know, we don't say, let's just get it off your chest for just no reason really is a cathartic experience when people participate in talk therapy. And talk therapy means different things to different people, and there's many different approaches. It could be seeing a psychotherapist and, and using some very traditional psychotherapy methods, kind of the man on the couch thing. It could be talking to Diane, our licensed counselor, 
and having a conversation and working on short-term solutions and how to manage this and how to set some goals. It could be a group therapy. All of these are options and available methods for talk therapy. But I don't want us to lose sight of some of the other available things. Often, couples counseling is needed and important when anybody is managing depression. Because just like MS, there's a spillover effect. Depression never just happens to the person with depression. There's, like I said, this, this ripple effect that it will also influence and or impede the relationship with, within the family unit. Pet therapy is very important. And sometimes having that pet that can just love you unconditionally is a good idea. And sometimes we think about that when we're talking to people about depression. Who else, who else, what fulfills you? Oh my dog, that's not a silly comment. That really can be helpful. And then having a best friend. Now your best friend can't be, oh let's have a pity party together. That best friend has to be somebody that's gonna love you unconditionally and understand and accept that depression is indeed a disease and not a character flaw. And so again, choose your friends wisely when you're talking about depression. All right, so comprehensive management. When we talk about the wellness focus, really what we wanna do is think about what can you do within your powers to help you manage and get through, get out of that dark hole. How can you feel better about yourself? How can you get rid of the guilt? How can you see that you are worthy of your love and your family's love? One way is let's use natural endorphins we're gonna talk about exercise. Dr. Green said we always talk about exercise, so I had to throw an exercise slide up there, but it really, exercise has to be something that's pleasurable for you so that you, again, get those endorphins going and that you can sustain that because that's gonna be part of your overall wellness pattern for the rest of your life. We're gonna talk about journaling. Remember when you were a kid and you had your first diary? And you thought, oh, God, this is the best thing? That's still important, especially if you're struggling with expressing of your feelings. So that's important. Meditation, taking a few minutes for yourself. Meditating. Now, I'll tell you, the people that are really depressed or have really high anxiety, you're gonna laugh at these kind of things because you're not there. We gotta get you off the ledge before we can um, introduce some of these interventions. Mindfulness, we'll talk about that. And then just having a supportive environment is very, very important. So the next few slides are gonna be some resources for you. Exercise really can help depression and it can be something as simple as a chair exercise to something like running marathon. Again, it has to be what makes sense for you, but it can ease depression. I think just because you're not focused on the negative and you're looking at, okay, I'm gonna do something and I'm gonna make an accomplishment. So you know it has to be true if you can find it on WebMD, right? <laughs> but you can, write your way out of depression. And here is a site that will give you some tips to how to journal and how to make journaling effective for you. And so that may be an option for you. Now journaling doesn't necessarily have to be sitting there with a notebook or a diary. It could be electronic. You could type your journal into your computer or it could be voice memoed if you have trouble with dexterity. It's really just a way to express what's going on, to get yourself in the moment, and to identify your feelings so that when you go to talk therapy, you can work on those. Meditation. Now, you guys laughed when I said take a moment to yourself and meditate, but really, if you look at this PET scan, you can see how calm the brain looks after just 10 minutes of meditation versus this kind of hot brain over here. 
So meditation really can calm people down and put them in the right spot. And so that's important. The last thing is mindfulness. Now this is the new buzzword in the medical and med mental health profession. If you haven't heard this, this is what this means. Mindfulness is a state of active, remember that word, it, you're in control. Open, you have yourself in a place where you don't have to be judgmental. Attention on the present. What is gonna happen in the here and now? Not what the future is, not, oh my God, what happens if I have a flat tire on the way home, kind of thing. It's observing your thoughts and feelings without judgment. You don't attach good or bad. It's just, this is what's going on right now. This is how I feel right now. This is it for this moment. Then later, you can go back and examine that. But finding pleasure in the moment and awakening yourself to the experience is what mindfulness is about. And again, here's a website if you want to try this um, for um, you to do on your own. So as Dr. Rashway talked to us about phone apps, if you go to your Google store, you go to your Apple iTunes store, you can find a couple. And here's a couple that I have downloaded for myself. Headspace, Stop, Breathe, and Think, and then any kind of meditation or relaxation music may be helpful for you. Not if you have a migraine, maybe, but otherwise it may be helpful to help you see your way out of this pit, this dark place that you may be in with this depression. All right, now we're gonna talk a little bit about worry. Well, you know what? Worry's good in some perspectives, right? We want to worry a little bit if we have a big test coming up because that's going to motivate us to study. We want to worry a little bit about if we are presenting a big program or a big project because it keeps us focused. It keeps us centered. Too much worry is not a good thing. And that's called general anxiety disorder. So again, it is much better to have laugh lines than to have worry wards, right? But it's a really true mental health condition, general anxiety disorder. And people that have this know that they're worrying and they know they can't, have, can't stop it. Interestingly enough, when I was doing some research, I found that although we talk about uh, depression all the time, the incidence of anxiety in MS folks as a diagnosis is much higher, or a little higher, than that of depression. And so anxiety needs to be addressed. And this can be a standalone symptom, or it can be in conjunction with depression, and I'll show you that. Again, three times more likely in the MS population to have general anxiety disorder than um, for the folks with MS. And then you can see some of the other statistics here. Panic disorder is greater in the MS population. Obsessive compulsive disorder is greater in the MS folks than in the general population. And we really have to tease that out because maybe that, uh, that, that regimen is what keeps you, your cognition straight. So really is it an obsessive compulsive disorder or is it a cognitive coping strategy? So we have to figure that out. But interestingly, social anxiety is higher in the MS population, and, and we see this. We see social isolationism in the MS folks um, is, is relatively common. So general anxiety disorder is more common in women. It's often manifest itself at two different spectrums. One, at diagnosis. There's the anxiety of what the future holds. You know, we just had a 20-year-old who come in to our office, he just was diagnosed, just started on a disease-modifying drug, went away to college, and, and his family called and said, I, I, his fatigue is horrible. I said, let, have him come in. I wanna talk to him. And really what it is, he's got anxiety. He's anxious. He's anxious because he's a new college kid. That's anxious, 
anxiety producing to begin with. He's anxious because he has a new diagnosis. He's anxious because he has a new medication that may have some side effects. So he really has a general anxiety disorder at diagnosis. On the other end of the spectrum, there's those folks that have progression and there's that worry. What happens next? What happens if I can't walk tomorrow? What happens if I wake up and I can't see? What happens if my disease progresses and I'm gonna to have to give up driving? And so that, when disease's progression is happening, also produces anxiety. So anxiety can happen by itself. Depression can happen by itself. But I will tell you, when anxiety and depression are together, there is increased thoughts of self-harm, suicide, and more social problems. These folks can't necessarily even talk to their families, more or less think about leaving the house. And so again, we need to pay attention. We need to ask the right questions. What are the risk factors? Female, history of or current depression, like I just said, and if you don't have, if you don't have a strong uh, social support. So women that live by themselves with anxiety and depression are at the greatest risk for suicide or self-harm. And so heads up to us healthcare providers that we need to be on the lookout for this. So symptoms, well, you can guess them, right? It's this constant worry. Worry about things that are everyday things. Like I said, I'm worried that I'm gonna have a flat tire on the way to work. Well, you know, all of us drive, all of us, but not all of us worry that we're gonna have a flat tire on our way to work. So, and they have trouble controlling these constant worries. They get kind of an obsession with a worry. Oh my God, if I do this, I'm not gonna be able to do that. If I do this, I'm not gonna be able to do that. And it goes on and on and on and on. And you just wanna zap that cycle. But people with a general anxiety disorder know they worry, they just can't stop. So they have trouble relaxing. Guess what? If you're always worried about that flat tire on the way to work, you're not gonna be able to concentrate about anything else. They're easily startled. We've already talked about sleep related to depression, but anxious people often can fall asleep easily, but once they wake up, they can't get themselves back to sleep because their mind won't stop. It's on this worry cycle, okay? Get then they feel tired all the time. They feel tired because they haven't slept well, but they feel tired because it takes a whole lot of energy to worry. It takes a ton of energy to worry all the time. So there's physical symptoms that can happen related to this. People may have more headaches. They have muscle aches. May have stomach aches or unexplained pains. Just achy, I just don't feel good. And often, that's because we just don't have the coping mechanisms to feel good. It takes all of us just to be able to say, oh, it's okay, it's just a little headache. I'm gonna take some Tylenol to go away. But people that have general anxiety disorder says, oh my God, I got a headache. Oh my God, how am I gonna get it to stop? It's gonna interfere with my work. Oh my God, what if it's a brain tumor? Oh my God, should I go to the emergency room? So again, that's a true fear for these folks. They may have trouble swallowing, it's often a dry mouth syndrome. They may tremble or twitch. See this a lot with people that are anxious. They're irritable, they may sweat a lot, they feel lightheaded, or they may feel out of breath because again, it takes a whole lot of energy to worry. They may have to go to the bathroom a whole lot. So this may be urine, but very typically these folks have some serious issues with diarrhea and some uncontrolled bowel movements because their worry gets to the point that they have um, a sympathetic response and they will have uncontrolled stools. How do we manage it? Just like we manage depression. Medications may be helpful, 
Talk therapy may be helpful. And taking that wellness approach certainly is going to be helpful. There's some very specific psychotherapies that can be very beneficial for people that have general anxiety disorder. So when I talk to people about going to th talk therapy or going to see a counselor or going to see a psychotherapist, they'll say, I can just talk to anybody. Or they'll say, Mary Kay, can I just come in to talk to you? I say, no, I need you to go to a professional because they have some very specific methods to manage your mental health that I don't necessarily have the background for. And so just to know, just in knowing, I should say, the fact that there are avenues and very specific approaches to talk therapy is sometimes all people need to hear. Okay, if they're gonna do something more than sit me on a couch and talk to, about what I did when I was four years old, I'll be happy with that, I'll go. Now, don't cry over spilt milk. This is kind of how do you view the world? Is it half full or is it half empty? You know, people with depression and anxiety want to not cry over spilt milk. They want to see every single day as happy or that glass is half full, but they just can't sometimes. And so therefore, we need to intervene and help them get over that hump. All right, let's talk about some case studies. Jody is a 38-year-old female with relapsing remitting MS. She's had MS for 20 years, so it's not new for her. Her MS is well controlled on an oral disease modifying therapy. She's busy though. She works full time, a job that has a lot of demands on her. She's an administrative assistant at a bank, and so she has to be on top of her game so that she doesn't make some significant errors, especially that may have some financial consequences to people. She has three school-aged kids, and she manages those. You know, she gets the lunch pack, she gets the permission slip signed, she makes sure they have the right tennis shoes on gym day, all of those things. She's managing the household and all her children's activities. You know, because we got dance, we have gymnastics, we have soccer, we have piano, we have violin, we have all these activities that her children are involved in also. She also is caring for her elderly parents who have their own health issues. So she is tending to their keep. She's making sure their medications are correct. She's calling the doctors for them. She's going over there once the mom's falling on the floor and you have to make sure her hip's not broken, those things. So she's busy, right? Sounds like a lot of our lives, right? Here's the deal, though. Jody, at her most recent office visit, complained of being tired all the time, right? Well, who wouldn't? So we have to look a little bit further. What could this be? Could it be her busy lifestyle? Maybe. Could it be her medications? Maybe. Maybe I need to take a look at her medications and see if there's a new medicine especially that might be the culprit. Could it be her sleep habits? She's ironing that, those kids' uniforms at midnight and up by five. So could be her sleep habits. Could it be other things? We already talked about thyroid. But you know what? Women that have heavy menses often have a, over, a chronic fatigue syndrome. So we have to make sure that we're addressing her medical conditions in addition to what else is going on with her MS and potentially her mood. We're gonna check her vitamin D and her vitamin B levels to make sure that's not an influence. All of those things check out. We're good on all of those things. So what do we do next? <laughs> She's gonna come in and chat with me. And this chat may be an hour, an hour and a half. But guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna help ferret it out. We're gonna to try to see if we can put things in different buckets. Is this MS? Is this lifestyle? Is this mood? Is this vitamin D? Is this because of your thyroid level? I'm gonna ask her, what does she do for herself? 
Is she taking care of herself in any way? Is she lost in taking care of all others? What does she do for fun? Because we certainly know that we need to stay grounded by taking care of ourselves and having a little fun for ourselves and doing that without guilt. What kind of on purpose exercise does she do? She'll say, you know, I got I, I run, I park far away at the, and walk and get into the bank, but is she doing anything on purpose? And I usually use those words too. I'm gonna finally ask her, how's your mood? Where are you at? I'm tired, Mary Kay, I'm tired all the time. Well, you just told me you're not doing anything for fun, you're not doing anything for yourself, you're not doing any exercise on purpose. Are you getting any pleasure out of life? How is your mood? And she's gonna say, I'm just deflated. I'm like that flat balloon that we saw. So I'm gonna ask her, tell me more about that. Tell me more about those feelings. And we're gonna explore that and we're gonna talk about that. What should we do? Well, I'm gonna first focus on this wellness, things she has control over. And so let's go back to that list. I'm gonna ask her to journal, because you know, she's not finding anything for herself. Maybe she just needs a little introspection to say, what's going on? How am I feeling? Where are my burdens? And can I lose some of those? And can I lose some of the guilt that's related to those? I'm gonna ask her to meditate, and I'm gonna tell her about the phone apps. I'm gonna say, okay, once you finally drop off the kids to school on the way to work, turn on your meditation or your relaxation music. Or find that five minutes before you walk in the door after you work for yourself. So five or 10 minutes of alone time where she can just go to a park and watch the birds or do something so that she can decompress before she has to face the second part of her day. And I'm gonna ask her to exercise. And say, I don't care what you do. Find something you like, do it, and let's see if it makes a difference. Because I'm gonna have her come back in a month. I'm gonna tell her to call me sooner, or send me a My Mercy message, preferred. Oh, and then I'm gonna have her come back. Because remember, None of this is a short-term fix. At that time, when she comes back, she says, ah, I'm okay. But I'm gonna say, okay, let's see if we can step it up a level. I'm gonna maybe add on a low dose of a medication, and I'm gonna get her hooked up with Diane, who can meet with her for short-term counseling, or get her a community resource counselor. And I'm gonna say, you're doing great with your exercise. How's that meditation going? Let's talk about mindfulness. Let's add on something else to see if we can help you. And most importantly, I'm not gonna lose her. I want her to come back. I want her to stay in touch. So we're gonna use our, our circle. We're gonna talk about medication, wellness, and talk therapy. But three months later, she comes back and she's not any better. She's depressed, she misses work now, she's skipping out on her kids' activities, she's gained a whole lot of weight, she doesn't sleep well, and she's drinking a whole bottle of wine every night to get herself to go to sleep. <sighs> We've spiraled downhill, haven't we? So that's why I don't wanna lose her. I wanna stay connected, and I'm gonna say, I don't care what state you're in, when I see you back again, I need you to come back and we need to be open and honest with each other because this is a partnership that we're gonna get through this together. What do I do next? She's maxed me out. She, I'm gonna refer her to psychiatry. There's a couple of times that I'll say, uh, you're beyond what I can do with you. I need a professional psychiatrist to manage your medicines because you may need dual therapy or you may need escalation of medicines behind my comfort zone. And if people are self-medicating with alcohol or drugs, I'm gonna refer those to psychiatry because that's a problem bigger than our center can handle or should handle. And so that's not a character flaw, remember. 
It's a chemical flaw, and we, I need a, a psychiatrist to help manage those chemicals, either that they're prescribing or that you're voluntarily putting into your body. Second case, Tony is a 59-year-old male who has had MS for 15 years. He's doing well, he's active. He is just like the picture-perfect healthy person, right? He's got his life together. He's had MS, but it's not getting him. He's active, he runs marathons, he's got a high-power job, he makes a great income, his children are grown, his wife is supportive of him, his MS is very well managed, he takes just his disease-modifying therapy, he takes a medication for fatigue periodically, and he takes his vitamin D like he, can, he should. He loves, when he's not working, to be outdoors. He looks forward to retirement and all is well. Okay, we got the picture? So guess what? Tony, of late, says he's having trouble sleeping. Eh, not so uncommon. You say, you know, I'm getting older, I'm having trouble, I think I better call the nurse's line and see what I should do about this. So he calls the nurse's line, NL, and he asks for a sleep medication. Well, our very wise nurses say, Let's just try something over the counter to start with. Maybe this is just a temporary thing. So let's try an over the counter medicine and check back with us to see if that's working for you. Okay, sounds reasonable, right? Well, he calls back and he says, It ain't cutting it. I'm not doing, it's not doing anything for me. And so um, Mary then talks to Dr. Rashway and says, what, what, what should we do? And Dr. Rashway said, Okay, let's go ahead and add on a, a a sleeping medication that I want him to use discreetly and sparingly and um, with great discretion. So he does that and we think everything's fine and dandy, right? He's, he's sleeping a little bit better, he doesn't call back, but his next call, when he calls, the next week, he talks to us and he reports back that he's having a headache and that he's tried over-the-counter medications and it's not helping. He also has this nagging stomach ache. He tells the nurse that he's worried that he's underperforming at work and that he's really worried about what his boss will think and he doesn't want to tell his boss about this headache and about this stomach ache and this trouble sleeping because he's really worried that he'll get judged. And then he worries a little bit more that he'll get judged. He just doesn't feel well. So, he's not sleeping well still, so he agrees to come with, meet with me. We spend a great deal of time sorting out his symptoms. In addition to those physical complaints, he also tells me that he's in this constant, constant worry about losing his job. It's unfounded, his reviews have been great, nobody said boo to him about his work, but he's reaching retirement, and he has this overall feeling that people, once they reach the age of 60, are pushed out of his profession, and they hire the young kids. And he's worried, he constantly worries, about losing his job because he has a headache. His wife shares that he's short-tempered and short-fused that he's snappy and he's irritable and he, you know, she says, pass the salt, and he's like, slides it across the table, that he's just not quite right, he's out of sorts. And their once vibrant social life is now vanished. They used to go out, they used to have date nights, they used to have friends come over to play poker, they used to go on cruises with their friends, but now it's just the two of them with the recliner, with the remote, sitting there clicking through the TV channels, okay? They're not doing anything. They're not even talking to each other. He tells me also that the relationship with, his relationship with his son and daughter is now strained, his daughter-in-law. And why? Because he refuses to watch his grandchild, who's the love of his life. He loves his grandchild but he doesn't want to babysit the grandchild, not because he doesn't love the grandchild or doesn't want to help out the, the parents. He's worried that something's gonna happen to this child while he's watching him. What if he falls? 
What if he gets cut? What if he chokes? What if, what if, what if? He drives back home from work almost every day when he gets two blocks away to make sure he's closed the garage door. Okay? Again, did I close it? Did it close? If I didn't close it, is somebody going to break in? If they break in, what will they take? Oh my God, I won't have my computer. And I need my computer because that's how I do my work. And if I don't, do my, if I don't have my computer, I can't do my work. I'll lose my job. See how it goes? He double checks every door, every window, before he goes to bed. He falls asleep easily. But when he wakes up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and it may be he wakes up because he's got a pain in the leg or because his bladder wakes him up, or he could just wake up with worry, he will not allow himself to go back to sleep because he's afraid he'll oversleep. And if he oversleeps, he might have that flat tire on the way to work. And if he has that oversleeps and has that flat tire, his boss will judge him, and then he'll lose his job. And then what kind of a pickle will he be in? What's his diagnosis? Anxiety. anxiety, general anxiety disorder. Can he help it? Can he just snap out of it? No. That's the hardest thing. It's the hardest thing because he knows he's worried. His wife knows that he's got this, his, himself on this worry cycle. He just doesn't know how to get out of it. So how should we treat it? All three. I hear from the smart table in the front. Talk therapy, medication, and wellness. So we're kind of back to where we started, aren't we? There's some things that we can do to help. There's some things that we need to rely on our professional team, our social worker, our counselors, our psychiatrist, our psychotherapist to help us with. And there's some things that are within that own person's locus of control. Not when they're on the cliff, but when they have themselves settled down. And those wellness things need to be lifelong behaviors. Living with somebody that has anxiety and depression, either or or both, can be a very, very tough job for the spouse or for anybody else that's in that household. And so it's very important that people that are caretakers recognize that the person that has anxiety and depression or the combination, it's not under their control. So the caretaker needs to be informed. They also need to be knowledgeable. They need to buy into the treatment plan and be supportive of that treatment plan even if it includes going off work for a couple months or a month or so so that they, they can get this acute treatment. But they also need to take care of themselves because to be supportive, to be the good caretaker, to be the good spouse, that person has to be whole. And it's a tough job. It's a really tough situation having depression and anxiety, but it's a really, really tough job being the spouse or, the, or having somebody that you love have those. And so anybody that's a caretaker also needs to pay attention to their, um, their health. And there's actually on the back of the handout, there's some tips for caretakers. Okay.